Good morning everyone. Lovely to see you. Thank you for those that came uh, in person at nine o'clock here and it was lovely to see folks in Balmston at nine as well. We have two services this morning already and now welcome to all those who are watching live on Facebook or catching up later on Facebook or on YouTube. Smashing to be with you. We've got Rich preaching later so that's a treat. Um, Rich is being ordained in a week's time at York Minster. They're only allowed 30 people, so it's going to be very small and, and odd, um, but it will all be uh, streamed. You can watch that um, on the, uh, it's the York Minster Facebook page, is it, or the Diocese, Diocese of York? Diocese of York. Diocese of York Facebook page. Uh, in the evening, it starts at 6.30. 6 um, and uh, so do join in uh, with that. Last week, as you know, we had a, a, a good shindig for Barb as we uh, marked her transition from curate to uh, sort of fully-fledged deacon here. She sent us a, a lovely uh, thank you card for the present that uh, we got her, uh, which was some uh, a kintsugi vase as well as a kintsugi making kit. And Barb writes, a huge thank you for everyone at Emmanuel and Barmston who contributed towards my beautiful gifts given to me at my licensing as deacon. They are so appropriate, and I look forward to breaking some china and mending it with gold sometime soon. Thank you for all your support, hugs and prayers during my curacy, and I'm looking forward to continuing working with God and yourselves at Emmanuel into the future. Lots of love and virtual hugs, Barb B. Some sad news from the family. Uh, our friend and sister, Mary Smethurst, who was 95, sadly died this week. Uh, she had a stroke, it was nearly a year ago, can you believe, and uh, had uh, a heart attack and uh, died quite suddenly. Uh, her family were with her, and uh, now the funeral is going to be at the East Riding Crematorium. It will be by invitation only, I'm afraid, um, but again, we'll be live streaming that, so you can join in 
and I know your prayers and thoughts, as well as mine, are with uh, all of Mary's family. She was such a wonderful person, wasn't she? And I'm sure, like me, many of you will have been in receipt of her wonderful hugs, which we will miss. One more notice. Um, our friend Sam in Uganda, who runs the charity Saved on the Street, uh, the school that they run is uh, locked down at the moment, so brilliantly Sam has got together some education packs which has got lessons for a whole year to go to every child. Um, one pack costs only £15, that's not bad for a whole year's education, and he's asked us if we were able to um, support them and fund some of those packs. So if you're able to uh, get £15 to Diana, she will pay it in, so it can come into the office here at Emmanuel uh, or stick it through the vicarage door. Just please mark it really clearly, saved on the street, um, so it doesn't go in church funds by accident. Thank you so much. That's quite enough talking, isn't it? Shall we do some praying? Our opening prayer, please join in the Amen at the end. Faithful one, whose word is life, come with saving power to free our praise inspire our prayer and shape our lives for the kingdom of your son jesus christ our lord amen please join in the singing of our first hymn amazing grace Jasmine helping us with the technology today, so uh, it's great to have them with us as well. Grace, it's something we love to sing about and love to celebrate, but so hard to get our heads around. If we're really honest, we'd much rather God paid people what they deserved, especially him next door. And uh, it's really why we're going to be having the readings that we're going to be having in just a bit, when everyone's sort of grumbling about people not getting what they deserve. Well, we're, if we're honest, if we did get what we deserve, we'd be for it, wouldn't we? We need to come before God in penitence and faith 
and confess our sins and receive his freely given forgiveness. And so let's pray these words together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought and word and deed, and in what we have left undone. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us for all that is past. And grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're going to spend some time in sung worship now. Our first song is, You are the vine, we are the branches. Keep us abiding in you. In that state of forgiveness and grace, then we stick with our Father God and receive his nourishment.
Jonathan and Anne are now going to bring us our Bible readings, first of all from the book of Jonah, and then a parable from Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew. Good morning, everyone. The lesson this morning is from Jonah, chapter 3, verse 10, to chapter 4, verse 11, and is a part of the book where Jonah's already encountered the big fish and has been ministering in Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and, has, uh, and we take the story up from there. Then God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way. And God relented from the disaster he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed the Lord and said, Our Lord! Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish. For I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Then the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. The Lord prepared a plant, made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning dawned, the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head, so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It's better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It's right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant which you have not laboured, nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left, and much livestock. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Good morning. This morning's lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. The parable of the workers in the vineyard. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, You also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because... I am generous. So the last will be first and the first will be last. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Well, good morning, everybody. I am Rich Townend, the curate here at Emmanuel in Bridlington. And uh, this is actually my last week as a member of the laity, as they say. I get ordained next week, so um, after next week I'll have to wear the dog collar. And you might expect different things from me, but I'll still be exactly the same person. Um, but still, quite a significant week, really, in my life. Now, before I trained for ordination, of course, I was a teacher. And uh, some, one of the things I often used to hear in the classroom was the phrase, it's not fair. Three words there that we are all pretty familiar with. And it's a phrase that we're all quite good at saying. You see, we recognise the injustice in our lives, particularly when it infringes on our rights. I would hear it on a daily basis in the classroom from the children, but also often from the parents. And come to think of it, now as a parent myself, it's a phrase I often use too. And those are exactly the words that came to mind when I read today's gospel reading. It's one of these parables, these clever stories that Jesus told, using a familiar setting to draw his listeners in. And the setting here is the practice of workers waiting at sunrise to be chosen to go to work. And, and at the end of the day, they would receive their payment for the day's work. This was a Torah regulation. It was the way things were done. And it's no surprise to read this in the Gospel of Matthew, which was written for a Jewish audience. Now, the normal rate of pay was a denarius, which was just about enough for a family to survive. But these people who would be waiting each day for some work, they were by no means wealthy people. So throughout the day, this wealthy landowner gathers workers for his vineyard. He starts early and he comes back at nine. And then he comes again at midday. And then he comes again at three o'clock to gather more hands. And finally, he comes back at five o'clock. And he asks those that are still there at five o'clock, why are you standing here all doing nothing? And they say, because no one has hired us. Nobody has picked us. Now, in my mind, I am taken back to my primary school days, not as a teacher, but as a child and being chosen to play football at break. I loved football, but I wasn't blessed with the greatest natural ability. I was tall and gangly and slightly uncoordinated. So I would be among the last to be chosen. But that was fine because I would still get my game of football and over the years I became slightly less lanky and slightly more coordinated and progressed to becoming the penultimate player to be picked. But that's a, a rather flippant illustration because for the people in this parable, this is not a game. This is their livelihood. It is how they make ends meet. The text suggests that they are not lazy or late. They just have not been chosen. Waiting expectantly all day, only to be overlooked time and time again. You might have been in that position before, firing off job applications left, right and centre and hearing nothing back. It's frustrating and demoralising. In these parables that Jesus told, where he draws the listener in with this familiar setting, the listener then expects to know how the story will end. For this story, there will obviously be a weighted system of pay, so those that have toiled the longest will get the greatest reward. But another great technique of the parable is to catch the listener off guard with a twist, a surprise ending that really catches their attention. And here is the sucker punch. Those who have been working for just a few minutes receive exactly the same reward for those that have been out in the fields all day. The other thing that parables do is they point to a higher truth. They illustrate something much deeper and profound about the kingdom of God. 
And in this story, the landowner is God. And the payment at the end of the day is his grace. And this is open not just to those that have been these insiders who have been serving faithfully all their lives, but it's also open to those latecomers to the party. Do we still say it's not fair? Last week, Richard shared with us the parable of the unforgiving servant. And in response to Peter's question of how many times um, he, should be, he should forgive his brother, Jesus replies that forgiveness should be unlimited. And of course, we know that through the cross, Jesus modelled unlimited grace and he calls on us, his followers, to do the same. Today's parable flows from an encounter that Jesus had where he meets a rich young ruler and asks, what must he do to receive eternal life? Another familiar story to which Jesus replies, you must give away everything and follow me. Again, Jesus is setting out the lifestyle that he is modelling to surrender everything, to be a living sacrifice. Of course, in that encounter, the rich man walks away because he's not prepared to do what is required. And the lesson for us is that we must be prepared to give things up in our lives to surrender everything to God. But those two stories, the parable of the unforgiving servant and this encounter with the rich young man, are different to today's parable because they focus on what is required of us to forgive others and to live sacrificially. These are the actions of the one whose heart is set right with God. But this parable of the workers of the vineyard is focused on what God has done for us. Justice is God's business. It's not for us to judge. It is not for us to say the system is unfair. That is up to God and God alone. So do we still say it's not fair? In our Old Testament reading that we heard from Jonathan today, it's all about a prophet who felt the same. Jonah wants to see the city of Nineveh face the wrath of God's judgment. But the people of that city repent. God has mercy on them. And Jonah feels like a bit of a fool. It's not fair! He says to God. Now Jonah really is a, a strange case as a prophet. He, he thought he was righteous, but really he comes across as obstinate and judgmental and pious and arrogant and privileged. He did not think God's mercy should extend to the city of Nineveh, where the Assyrian people were known for their brutal nature and their, their cruelty to the Israelites. Jonah wanted vengeance, not mercy. And again, we see the grace of God at work. He treats the Ninevites, this evil, cruel city, in the same way as he would treat the Israelites. The Gentiles and the Jews receive equal treatment. I think it's really interesting that in that Bible passage there, you get the phrase that um, the Ninevites did not know their right hand from their left meaning they did not know any better. And it's funny how that phrase is now in common use. Well, perhaps sometimes our attitude is a little bit like Jonah. Perhaps we look around at others and compare our lives and say, it's not fair. But what's really not fair is this, that today, people in our world will die of hunger. That people in our world are treated as second-class citizens because of the colour of their skin. That people in our town don't know where they will lay their head tonight. Most of us are probably a bit like Jonah. We live fairly privileged lives in comparison to the majority of people in the world. We live in a land of plenty built upon a proud empire that let's face it, exploited weak and vulnerable people from other parts of the world. That's part of our privilege. 
As for me, I'm white and I'm a man and I have to acknowledge that that, that gives me a head start in life. It's easy to judge. It's easy to say, it's not fair. And when I look at this story of the labourers in the vineyard, I am tempted to think the same. But my mind is taken back to Calvary and Jesus on the cross with two criminals, one on his left and one on his right. These were bad people who deserved some form of punishment for their crimes. One of the criminals hurled insults at Jesus, but the other said, we are punished justly, yet this man has done nothing wrong. Then turning to Jesus, he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I love, I love that encounter. I love that story. I love that verse. And I love those words of Jesus. Jesus could see clearly that this man believed in his heart. At the very last moment, he put himself right with God and received God's grace. Now, we can speculate on the nature of that man's crime, and many have. What had he done to warrant this most brutal of punishments? What kind of life did he lead? What trail of destruction did he leave behind? How many lives had been ruined by his actions? And some people might still say, it's not fair. It's not fair that I have made the right choices all of my life and yet have to spend my heavenly reward among those who have committed the most appalling crimes. But we don't know this criminal's background. The torment he may have suffered at the hands of abusive parents. The neglect he faced that led him to a life of crime simply to survive. The desperation he faced in trying to find any work. The feelings of self-loathing. I speculate, but you get the picture. Last week on our online service, Richard talked us through a strategy for helping us to forgive called REACH. And the E of REACH stood for empathy. To put yourself in the place of another person. Put yourself in the place of the criminal. Put yourself in the place of the person that you fall into the trap of judging or criticising. When we try to understand the world from someone else's point of view, it often looks very different. I'm going to finish an ex with an example from a modern day parable, if you like, from the Tour de France. Uh, I love watching La Tour, it actually finishes today. It's a three week adventure with dozens of different dramas unfolding each day. Each stage is a race within a race. I love the behaviour of the peloton, that's the, the group of riders, as it takes on its own character, snaking across the Alps and the Pyrenees. I love the teamwork and the individual heroics. Last week, I watched as a rider made a break really, really early on in the stage. All by himself, he powered through the course, increasing his lead over the peloton. For 150 kilometres, he did this using every bit of energy he could summon. And then the peloton started closing in. This rider was out there in the front all day. Surely he wouldn't get caught. But his legs were getting weary. He looked over his shoulder. They were getting closer. The peloton worked together, much like a flock of geese would do, a different one taking the lead so the others could conserve energy in the slipstream. And eventually this breakaway rider was caught with just a kilometre to go. He'd led the pack all day. But now he was in the pack, but still he didn't give up. With 100 metres to go, he summons one final burst of strength and took the lead again. He was almost at the line. Then out of nowhere, another rider came on the outside and unfancied 
unknown sprinter and took the victory at the death. Now I thought, that's not fair. Where is the justice in that? But now I reflect on that and I think about our story today and remember that some of us have been given a head start in life. A privilege, if you like. Always at the front. And some are chasing behind, trying their best but not getting anywhere, disappearing in the crowd. I'm not sure who you would be in the illustration. The one who's always at the front or the one who never gets anywhere. Perhaps a bit of both. You might even be the one who gets your reward at the very last minute. But one thing I am sure of is this. When we say it's not fair, God is saying to us, but I am fair. I am fair to the labourer. I am fair to the criminal. I am fair to that unfaithful city of Nineveh. And I am unfair to you. That is the amazing thing about grace. It reaches the places we would never expect. Grace isn't concerned with background or privilege or upbringing or education or theological training or even ordination. God's grace is for each and every one of us. All we need to do is reach out and grasp it. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that by your grace we get what we do not deserve. And we thank you that your grace reaches everybody, regardless of where we're from and what our background is. We thank you for your generosity. And we ask, Lord, that we can model your grace and your generosity in our lives to all those who we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Rich. We're going to affirm our Christian faith together now. If you join in with the words in yellow uh, after each of these questions. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us, and rose again? We believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. We, we believe, believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This, this is, is our faith. faith. We, we believe, believe and trust in one God, Father, Father Son and Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. As we prepare to pray, we are going to sing Blessed Be Your Name in the land that is plentiful. Rich has been helping us think about life being fair or unfair. And this song very much reflects on life, which sometimes brings its blessings and sometimes real hardships. Written by uh, Beth and Matt Redman, who've known their fair share of trials themselves, which inspired the writing of this song. Full, where streams of abundance flow. Blessed 
Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the glorious name. going to say together the collect, the prayer of today, the 15th Sunday after Trinity. Lord God, defend your church from all false teaching. Give to your people knowledge of your truth, that we may enjoy eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now Brogan is going to uh, lead us in the rest of our prayers. Lord, you have given us eyes to see the wonders of your creation. Thank you for all you have made. Open our eyes so we can see wonderful things in the Bible too. Lord, in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us ears to hear music and speech. The wind of the birds, thank you for all you have made. Open our ears so we can hear you speaking to us this week. Lord, in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us tongues to taste of day, food and drink. Thank you for all you have made. Help us our tears and see that you are good. Lord in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us noses to smell the flowers, the sea and our dinner. Thank you for all you have made. Help us to sniff our danger and keep us all safe. Lord in mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, you have given us hands to touch to show and love and care. Thank you for all you have made. Comfort and heal all who are missing the human touch, everyone who is poorly and all who are sad. Lord in mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you so much, Brogan we're going to say the Lord's Prayer to end our prayers with. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We're going to uh, take our virtual offering, and the giving links will appear on the Facebook uh, feed uh, fairly soon. And uh, thank you so much for those who are giving, and uh, we do very much appreciate that. Our final hymn is my Jesus, my Saviour.
share the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. Now, Jaden and Tony have uh, put together uh, a little song called Reconciled, and uh, this is going to be our play out. Thanks ever so much for joining us, and hope to see you next week. Do pray for Rich and family as he's ordained next week, and uh, we'll see you next time. God bless you all. Bye.